I represent the far new north end of Burlington in a two seat district, uh, along with Representative Bob Hooper. Great. All right, so let's just get right into it on committee work. I know we're wrapping up the session here, so um, there's a lot of good stuff to get to. Um, and we can start with Emma. Uh, your committee heard some testimony on a few bills last week, S11 and S247. You were telling me there's some interesting things going on there. So would you want to dive in? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is really one for the political science nerds out there because I serve on House uh, Commerce and Economic Development. And that is a... Um, a committee that often only works on a limited number of bills, and that the reason why is that we throw a lot into one or two very large bills. Um, they're called usually omnibus bills, and that is essentially what S11 has turned into. So for all of the, um, the those who are running to your legislative uh, search engines, S11 will read like it's a bill about robocalls, and this is a lesson for what happens at the very end of a session where we needed a vehicle, a bill, um, to put two other bills which had multiple policy ideas into it because of, of um, timeline and procedure issues between the Senate chamber and the House chamber. So don't be disappointed if you go to find S11 and there's nothing in there actually about robocalls minus the title. So what it actually ha is in, in its um, sort of uh, uh, innards, if you will, is what was H703, which is currently in the Senate, which um, was an economic development bill with about 20 different ideas in it that we pass out of the House back in March, and then also H-159, which the, how, the Senate passed to us, um, which is basically a workforce development bill. And these are two major policy areas that my committee works on, and I can, do not have the time, nor do I think people would stay awake if I went through all like 40 different ideas in there, but I'll just mention a few of them that stand out. Um, so in H-703, uh, which was, I, I might have inverted them, this 703 is actually the workforce development bill. Uh, and these ideas, I just want to put a big asterisk. We're not at the end of the session yet. There's a lot of stuff that will happen between now and about a week from now that will go into a conference committee. So what I'm saying now may not be the final product of the bill. But as of right now, at least House Commerce position is, um, we've done a few things around the idea of trying to help uh, folks return to the workforce in Vermont. We've had a workforce, not necessarily shortage, I don't love that word. We've had um, workers uh, deciding not to go back to low-wage jobs that might have certain working conditions that they did not they did not agree with, with unreliable work schedules, whatever it might be. Um, but there's a lot of employers searching for, for, for folks at this point. So we're trying to figure out how to get people into critical occupations and also make sure that we have a workforce that's um, uh, agreeable for workers so they can make decent wages and you know and work and uh, work in places that have a career option for them so you'll see in 703 a lot of investments to try to keep people in Vermont there's a, um, a five thousand dollar incentive for graduates of uh, Vermont colleges who would be willing to stay here for two years um, basically a grant if they uh, agree to stay here and work for a Vermont employer um, we have a lot of investment in career technical centers in Vermont, which would be helping to not only for high school students and CTEs, but um, adult education programs that are also woven into those programs um, to help them offer more to their communities, including a big um, investment of a revolving loan fund for construction um, trade programs within CTEs to build um, affordable housing and also upfit blighted properties within regions around CTEs. There's about 15 of them around the state. So we thought that was really like a, a moment of getting two policies we really need advanced in one. Uh, we're investing more in our Department of Labor to help folks um, have staff there to help them find career um, advancing jobs in their regions. There's certainly regions that there's plenty of options like Burlington and others where it's a little harder, you know, in the Northeast Kingdom, et cetera. Um, two pieces uh, in 703 before I move on to the economic development side that stand out is that we, um, we put in money within our Department of Corrections. So justice-involved individuals, which are folks who've been in our correction systems, are community members as well. And when they often return <clears throat> from the uh, facilities and after they've served their, their sentences, there's not a whole lot of workforce support for them to successfully reintegrate into communities, have employers ready to employ them, to you know, provide flexible schedules for folks who are trying to navigate, um, checking in with their parole or doing other you know, things to make them um, sort of regrounded in their communities. So we have put in money for a pilot program to be run out of the Chittenden facility uh, to really think about the continuity of services. So, you know, working with folks when they're in the facility, but then the six months after they're out of the facility to make sure, as I mentioned, their employers are ready to support them and they have what they need to be successful. Um, then there's also a, a piece, Vermont has training um, within our facilities for folks 
to sort of get job skills uh, while while serving time. However, it's not they're not being prepared for skills that exist in Vermont. We have we're pretty well known to have a um, sign making facility and a furniture making facility in some of our our sites in the in the uh, state of Vermont. And those, you can't, you're not going to, you know, leave the facility and find a sign making job, for example. So we're trying to also invest money in this bill within the Department of Corrections to really rethink and modernize how we're preparing folks um, when they return. Uh, the one other thing I'll say in this, and then uh, this bill is forever long, so you can pause me with any follow ups in the phones. I'm sure are going to start ringing any minute now, Carol. So you know, that's a joke, just to. <laughs> get some humor in the mix because there's so much in this bill. But the other piece we've been learning about uh, since I've been a legislator in the last two years is how much more we need to do to really understand BIPOC Vermonters, Black, Indigenous, people of color in the state and their, uh, and their experience in the workforce and in sort of the business economic development world. So I, I think this is a first time um, investment, but for, we are investing uh, $250,000. We'll see if that stays in there to help with uh, career development, networking, um, job coaching, but also business development um, monies for BIPOC um, businesses and BIPOC professionals. I think that's first time ever investment for the state of Vermont. I'm proud of House Commerce for putting that forward. We learned a lot during the pandemic when we tried to get money from the state for business uh, grants to keep businesses open, how very little the state knew about BIPOC owned businesses and could even didn't even know where they were and connected. So we're really trying to move the needle to do intentional investments in that part of our Vermont community. Any questions so far before I move over to workforce or have, it, have your eyes glazed over? I mean, that's, it's, that's a long list yeah. of, of um, fascinating that like a lot is going into those bills. Yes. Yes, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, can I give three brief updates on the workforce side of it? Please and then do. I will then I yeah. will stop. I promise no. to share that airtime. As I said, we work on like two major bills essentially, and that's why right. you see like, you know, four months of work in two bills. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what was H-159 was um, a bill that was coming over from the Senate. Within that is are some more uh, business relief grants. It's going to turn into forgivable loans and how we, I think, are going to finally manage this for businesses that are still trying to recover from, the, um, from COVID and from the pandemic. Um, I think we could, we could have done a little bit better. This is my take on it around some criteria beyond the ARPA federal funds criteria for how that money gets used. But I am glad that there's some technical assistance in there to help businesses actually access that money. That has been another struggle is that folks aren't always ready with a profit loss statement and other criteria needed to, to access grants we've done in the past and this forgivable loan that's coming up. Um, so hopefully it's accessible, but we also are getting the money to those who really need it and not businesses that are doing okay and didn't need that um, infusion of public dollars. The other thing I'll just lift up here is around COVID paid, uh, the COVID worker paid leave program in this bill, which I think is going to be a very important piece for employers and for workers. It's one of the only real worker oriented pieces in this entire massive bill I've been trying to describe. And essentially it will um, repeat what the federal government had running for a good portion of the pandemic, but it's expired where basically if you run out of sick leave or you don't have much sick leave anyway, and you get COVID or you have to support someone for a COVID related reason, this is gonna be a state um, fund program to help employers, it's voluntary, employers don't have to participate. It's kind of like the hazard pay program, but basically they can apply and get um, most of the employee's salary covered so that you can have a basically extended paid leave to, if you're out with a COVID related issue. And this would run for um, the next fiscal year for the state. So that would be July coming up through the June of next year. And as we've probably all seen and experienced at this point, there's gonna be surges as schools reopen and wintertime, et cetera. So we're really hoping this can really support employers who wanna do the right thing, keep people employed and not have to take unpaid leave just simply because they um, are exposed to COVID or have COVID. So I'll pause there, okay. there's a lot more. Now, what is, so what's the remaining process for this bill? Like what, what, what other systems does this bill have to go through before um, it gets signed into law? Sure. So S11 will will act like its own bill, even though it has all these bill ideas in there that have sort of been touched by the Senate and House already. So S11 will be on the floor tomorrow, Tuesday. We may or may not end on Friday, believe it or not. So it will. This will be one of the last bills finalized, but this um, will present it as House Commerce on the floor. Of course, the body can amend or vote it up or down in the House, and then it goes back to the Senate, and the Senate gets to decide if they concur or they want to make further amendments or they want to go straight to a conference committee. And so if I suspect 
new, I'm a newbie, but I suspect the Senate will say to our S11 bill, let's just go to conference since this has really three other bills attached to it or two other big bills. And then, um, and then eventually when it's a conference committee, um, uh, goes to conference committee, comes back to both chambers, but you only get a yes, no vote on it. It's not no longer debate. Uh, it's no longer amendable. You can debate it. Um, and then again, this will probably be one of the last bills will pass since there's a lot of money in it as well. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, let's go. Let's go to Carol. Um, so, Carol, you're on the you're on the House Committee on Ways and Means. And just in case we didn't mention it before, um, Emma's committee is the House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, Carol, what have you been working on um, in your committee? I know we have S two eighty seven was something that you were looking at last week that I highlighted here. But anything you'd like to talk about? Well, I'd like to talk about S two eighty seven because yeah. it did pass the House overwhelmingly right. last week. Um, uh, in the 1990s, the Vermont Supreme Court in the Brigham decision said that um, students were entitled to substantially equal access to educational opportunity across Vermont. And after that decision, the legislature passed Act 60. Since then, there's been Act 68. But part of that law dealt with how to collect property taxes and other taxes on a statewide basis to fund education. And today that looks like residential, primary homes, income-based um, uh, revenue into the state coffers, non-residential property taxes from stores and factories and ski areas, second homes, and then other taxes such as sales tax, rooms and meals tax, and lottery. So that's the collection side of the formula. And that we were not focused on. What we focused on was um, the way the taxes are then distributed, the revenue is then distributed, or how you have access to that revenue. Um, and so even though uh, Act 60 later became Act 68, there was a funding flaw that persisted. And that flaw was in how students are weighted in the school funding formula. So under the original weights in the formula, an elementary student counted as 1.0 and a high school student counted as 1.25 to reflect the additional resources needed to pay for high school students' education. So we've all been to school, we can all think of high school sports and extracurricular activities and language requirements and more that make it more expensive to pay for a high school education than an elementary education. Similarly, extra resources are needed for academic success of children in poverty, middle school students and English language learners now known as English learners. So in 2017, in my first weeks in the State House, I introduced a bill to fix that flaw. And the result was a bill that came out, a law that came, that required a study to determine the correct way to account for students in the distribution portion of the formula using those, using what would be, after the study, corrected student weights. So finally this year, the Senate and the House have a, each voted to um, yes, to implementing the results of that weighting by increasing the weights for English learners, high school, poverty, rural schools, and middle schools. And that change is set to occur in the 24-25 school year. The Senate passed the bill over to us in, the, in our house. Our committee made changes to their bill, but kept the weights that the Senate also recommended. And now um, we'll see whether they concur with the work that we did and then it would just go to the governor or whether they would um, not concur and have a conference committee and make additional changes. And that's where that bill is. Great. Can I just add something, or sure. at least ask Carol? Because um, Carol, the and I'm so appreciative of you starting the whole process, really, that led us to 287. Um, can you just mention how Burlington, in particular, the impact that the weight, looking at the weights per pupil would have in Burlington? I don't mean to interview you, but I think it's such an important yes. piece. No, I'm yeah. glad you asked that. Yeah. yeah. Um, it would mean a if well, looking at 2020 figures and with a lot of caveats it would mean that at the same amount of money that 
uh, Burlington taxpayer is paying today, we would be able to raise 16% more dollars to spend on programs, a new high school bond and so forth. So it gives us added um, capacity at the same tax rate to improve our schools. Thanks for asking. That. Yeah, yes. no, I think, it's, well, I think it's important for particularly Burlington and Winooski mm -hmm. um, and anywhere there's sort of the taxing capacity issue has been an issue. It's, this is gonna be a real significant change for what we are able to do for our students here in Burlington. And in particular, our English la learner students, um, this, is, this is a big deal. It's only, I just wanna emphasize, yeah. this is a big it's, deal it's moment. Such a, yeah. It's such a big deal. Yeah. It's, um, and, and yet it should have been a small deal. It should have been that mm -hmm. over all these years, we were always um, correcting those weights. We didn't start out with the correct weights when Act 60 passed. Um, we only even had English language weights because um, we worked, especially this was, uh, he was a superintendent, George Cross at the time. He since was a state representative and now he's retired from that. But, um, you know, trying to get, uh, trying to, uh, put in the formula what we needed uh, to recognize that the, there are extra costs involved with teaching English language learners. And so the weight was ins insufficient. And finally, with this study, we had um, empirical evidence data that showed, yes, the weights were wrong. They were very underweighted students, poverty students, students um, for English language, the high school students had gone from the correct weight and had been put down. We never had enough weight for the rural kids. We just didn't have this formula correct at all. So now we know that um, updating these weights will happen on a more regular basis, but um, probably don't vary so much from year to year. It would take great educational sh uh, shift in how we provide education for the weights to be dramatically. Um, changed in future years, but we do know that we have the correct weights in the formula now. So it's and and it's going to be just wonderful for being able to provide equal access to educational opportunity across the state and in Burlington, which will help our property taxpayers and will help um, our our schools and our city thrive. Yeah, that's great. I mean, this is a. <laughs> I mean, and this is also like this is a national issue, like this type of th this question about school funding and, and properly weighting students is like a national problem. So the fact that we're dealing with this in Vermont at this time is, is really great. Do we do you know if are where are other states doing this? Are we like ahead of the pack as Vermont often likes to be or we're definitely we have a very different yeah. education funding system because mm -hmm. we are we decide we decided. Well, the, 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 our constitution requires um, that, that we have an education clause in our constitution. And the basis of the um, decision in Brigham in the late 1990s was based on our constitution putting in the constitution itself there, it established public schools. It was the only government ser service included in the constitution. Mm -hmm. So relying on that, um, our constitutional basis for equal educational opportunity, um, the court came to the conclusion that we needed that. And we said, and with Act 60, we share, we pool all of the property tax wealth in the state, plus some other revenue sources that I mentioned earlier. And we use that for all of our children. That doesn't, we are unique in that way. Yeah. Now there are foundation formulas in other states which we had a foundation formula before we had um, Act 60 and the Brigham decision th where weights are used. And that's where the whole idea of weights, we had weights in the foundation formula and we carried them over, but not enough attention was paid to them at the time. And so now we are rectifying that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Um, I guess a, a decent segue here is um, going to issues that are particularly important to communities in Burlington, things that you think are really important to your constituents. Um, 
We'll start with Emma. Do you have anything you'd like to? Yeah, I wanted to close the loop on um, several uh, Burlington charter change items. So the way that it works in um, in Vermont is that when a town like the like Burlington um, wants to change its charter, which is essentially the local constitution, if you will, that underlines um, how and um, how and what a local <laughs> town can do in terms of local ordinance. Uh, so we had one, two, three, four, we had five. <laughs> I don't know if that's a record, Carol, but we had five uh, that we it, we approved between about one to two years ago and, and yeah. they have to go through the town meeting process and then it comes to the legislature and the legislature ultimately gets to determine if the town is able to amend its charter. We weigh in more on certain towns than others depending on the topic. And so uh, Burlington, as I said, had five. Uh, the airport change, the airport commission, um, we added two seats to that. That was moved through H-454 last Actually, it, it was passed by the Senate this beginning of this session, so that is out and signed by the governor, so that has been um, on its way to being implemented by the city. H-448 was the thermal energy piece, which is around allowing the, the city to start to explore, um, looking at fees and assessments related to, this is a larger piece of climate change and looking at how to encourage new buildings and maybe in the future other buildings um, to move off of fossil fuels into more renewable energy sources to heat. Um, this doesn't change anything at the moment, just enables the city to start to explore an ordinance change or a fee structure. And if anything was related to fees, it would have to go back to Burlington voters, but they needed to go through this you know, elongated process to get the charter um, amended and then the legislature to weigh in. That should be headed to uh, the, the governor at this point. It passed through the Senate about a week or so ago and it had already been through the House. Um, H-708 was around just cause evictions. This one is one that I know a lot of people paid attention to, both renters as well as landlords in Burlington. Um, that had an interesting journey through the House, but it went through the House um, and was uh, adopted by the Senate as well and is off to the governor. And that allows basically people to have renters, I believe it's after one year of renting, because there were some changes along the way, um, to have, uh, for a landlord to have, a, have to have a just cause reason to evict someone. Right now it's pretty minimal um, and the housing discrimination um, uh, laws are, exist, but it's very hard to prove discrimination as a reason. And then, of course, if you can't prove that, if it was a whole other reason, um, people tenants are really in a pretty vulnerable position. 708, and now that if it gets signed by the governor, again, the city would have to go through the ordinance drafting process. So none of this, even, these concepts are approved. None of the actual details have been worked out yet. That's the, the city, it goes back to the city. They take like the third step of this process. Um, and then the final two, H744, is what ranked choice voting got put into, and that is for city council races only. And that would be how we vote on city council um, candidates, and essentially you would rank your choices versus having a winner-take-all um, uh, structure. Uh, that is, let's see, it passed out of the House. It's over in the Senate. I, I believe it's going to make it through this session, but again, we'll see what the governor does. And the final one was um, most recently passed this last March which was updating obsolete um, sex worker language within our charter that House of Ill Refute, as folks might recall. Um, and we are updating that language, but state law prevails here on this particular policy issue. However, it's still really important, at least in my opinion, I'm sure Carol would, would agree with me, to remove pretty sexist language out of our charter, um, even though state law prevails on this particular policy. And that is coming to the floor of the House this week. I don't know if it will make it by the end, but it's a pretty minimal policy idea. So I imagine we might be able to get that through the Senate to the governor before the end of the session. Great. Uh, Carol, same question. Issues okay, in so, Burlington. And also I would like to point out that Emma led the Burlington delegation on getting those part charter changes through. Absolutely every week um, worked on that more than once a week. Thank you, Carol. Uh, so <laughs> the... There's a lot that goes on. Yes, all it's of a lot of work to so, do. Yeah, yep. Yeah, thank you. First, uh, well, um, a lot of uh, some priorities that I heard about when I went door to door were uh, cost of living, taxes, affordability. Um, one of those is about social security, and we had we had a bill now where anyone living uh, a law now that anyone living exclusively on social security is receiving those social security benefits tax free. But this February, the House passed H-510, and that's a bill that would help middle-income seniors keep more of their Social Security benefits uh, by increasing the 2018 Social Security exemption by $5,000 to $50,000 for single filers and to $60,000 for married filers, including a benefit phase out over the next $10,000 of income. And that bill is 
in other bills right now. And then the child tax credit, um, until recently, uh, federally, there was a child tax credit that put money directly into the wallets and checkbooks of families with children. And this credit helped people pay for rent, childcare, and food. Uh, nationally, that credit reduced food insecurity by 25%. And for parents with more income, the credit helped toward mortgage payments as well as credit card um, payments, car payments, and student loan debt. So in February, the House passed H501. I actually co-sponsored that bill, which would create a Vermont version of the Vermont child of the child tax credit. So it would be a Vermont child tax credit. And this payment of $100 per month for a child six and under would lift uh, families with young children out of poverty and would also encourage young families to move to Vermont or to stay in Vermont and thrive. These were these were things that I heard about when I was going door to door. Um, this focus on young families addresses two goals. It reduces poverty for young children and helps meet our demographic challenges. Um, that uh, the way it came out of our house has changed um, so that uh, only, well, it has changed and we'll be, nego we'll be going to conference committee to, um, to advocate for that, for the way it came out of the house which is what I just described. Those are a couple things I could right. go on, but right. I'll wait for another question. <laughs> well, we're actually, we're running short on time here. We have about two minutes left. So I think oh. if we have enough time for just like a short statement from each of you, just a, a wrap up uh, thought or idea before we go, um, we can start with Emma. Oh, wrap up thought. Well, there's so much moving this week. I so I, I always wanted to say that um, I want to encourage folks to reach out if they have any questions, even if it's a topic that Carol, Carol and I didn't cover. We, we have touched a ton of different topics over the course of this session and biennium. Um, we'll both be out. I don't know if Carol is seeking re-election. Um, re-election time is right around the corner, so we'll be out and try and engage with voters soon. Um, it'll be very different than my first run two years ago, which was the height of COVID. So I'm looking forward to door knocking and engaging with folks. So folks can always reach out through social media or email or, or by phone. Um, and I would just really want to emphasize, I, especially for constituents in my district, I really try to engage with folks. So I want to hear what people are thinking. I want to help with questions. Um, that's, that's our job. So I'm here to, here to help. Thanks, Emma. And Carol? As Emma said, also, I am here to help, and um, I am also running for re-election, and I am out collecting signatures on my um, uh, petition, something that two years ago we couldn't do uh, because of the height of COVID. And um, I look forward to hearing more about what your issues and concerns are for Vermont and what your ideas are for how to make it better. And um, uh, I'll continue to focus on the priorities that I hear when I speak with you and listen to you. And um, I'll try to bring real solutions for your priorities when I'm doing that. Great. Thank you, Carol. And thank you both for joining us. Um, and thank you for tuning in to Under the Dome. We'll take a brief hiatus next week, then return May 16th with legislators Aaron Brady and James McCullough. You can watch this and other local political coverage on our website at cctv.org, our YouTube channel, or our channels at Comcast Channel 1087, Burlington Telecom 17, and 217. Thank you. See you next week.